Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please sit. Thank you. Our host, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Lagos, Professor Shade Ogunshola. Our keynote speaker, Professor Ni Oshundari, President of the Nigeria Academy of Letters, Professor Shola Akiriade, and the former President of the Nigeria Academy of Letters, Professor Duro Oni. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking the organizers of this symposium for the great honor done to me by this invitation. I must say that I have no real credentials to be a guest of honor at the 90th birthday symposium uh, by uh, the International Literati in celebration of uh, a living legend, a living literary legend, in the person and a Nobel laureate and also a globally acknowledged thorn in the flesh of rulers, governments, and oppressors here and abroad. But it is Wale Shoinka's versatility as a human that entitles us all to comment, even authoritatively, on his life and times and activities. He himself has very little respect for anyone's space whether religious, political, or even culinary. As Ivor Agiamandua puts it in his introduction to Essays in Honor of Wale Shoinka at 80, and I quote, Shoinka has a diverse and interesting character which makes him amenable to playing different roles within society. He is an individual with different creative abilities in all genres of literature, an actor whose presence dominates a room, a university lecturer, a cultural activist, with a notion of an egalitarian sense of life, a collector of artworks, especially sculpture, painting and poetry. He's also a musician, a shadow architect who designed his own home, globally traveled, a man with a trademark tunic shirt, unable to design his own clothes, if need be, a hunter by night, and above all, a wine connoisseur, a certified commandery de la difputé of the Republic of France. Shoinka interfered, and still interferes, with everybody's space. So we must not be shy to interfere with his. But I'm also grateful for this opportunity uh, because it gives me uh, a chance to repay or return a priceless favor, even if inadequately. In 2007, I turned 50, and my wife and I decided to launch the Orderly Society Trust a not-for-profit dedicated to the pursuit of a sane and organized society. To mark the day, my one preferred person to speak at the event for just over 50 guests was none other than Professor Wale Shoinka. It was a long shot. He could be anywhere in the world, and anyway, why should he bother to attend an event in all honor of someone who he barely knew? I called Maki, his son, my friend, and asked him if he would make the request on my behalf. He did. Prof was traveling, and he wasn't sure he could have even make it to Lagos, let alone attend the event. But the unbelievable happened. Prof came and attended the event, spent the whole time there, and even created a controversy amongst my many pastor friends when he suggested that there might not even be heaven. Today, my intervention is going to be restricted to a brief exploration of an aspect of the showing car phenomenon, what I've described as his public conscience. And my topic is showing the imperative of the public conscience. 
A conscience is perhaps the most important attribute of a moral being. Without it, a person is essentially amoral. A wholly bad situation, especially because it means that a person is either unwilling or unable to distinguish between right and wrong. Most of us have a personal conscience, but a public conscience is of a slightly different order of complexity. While the personal conscience monitors and regulates the individual's own moral hygiene, the public conscience is that compelling urge to mind the business of others and to make the community's moral state one's own business. It is what compels a person to find his place as a moral agent in society. It is what keeps a person awake at night because injustice is being done to someone else or some other persons or that the rights of some are being trampled upon and then causes him in the morning to openly challenge the oppressor in all his might and dread at the risk of everything. The public conscience is in those restless souls who can't look the other way when something seems wrong. Their noses are too sensitive. They smell a rat or something even more rancid all the time. And they just can't keep quiet. There are those who help the vast majority of us, more timorous souls, to speak our minds. They express the feelings that the majority are too petrified or too politically correct to utter. All notions of dignity, all observances of dignity flow from a public conscience, a belief that humans deserve to be treated as such, as humans, and that their living conditions must reflect their humanness that how they are treated, even when they are captured in a war, must acknowledge this basic fact. In some senses, the public conscience is the intersection between the divine and the secular. How human agency does the work of a just and compassionate God. Indeed, justice is a byproduct of the public conscience. The notion that evil must not go unpunished that some accounting for wrong done to others is important because few things are more humiliating, more demeaning for a person than to be cheated or taken advantage of without recourse. Martin Luther King's reassuringly optimistic words that the arc of the moral universe is long but that it bends toward justice is another way of saying that justice propelled and sustained by conscience is that long moral act and that it is conscience, the public conscience of the state or seekers of justice that assures us that time doesn't run out on fairness and justice and that they never become outdated. That the journey to justice and freedom and equality might be long, but the destination is inevitable. The public conscience can be an affliction, a disease, an, irres an irresistible urge to speak up or take action against perceived wrongs, injustice or oppression. And depending on the society in which the moral consensus obligo is compelled to act, especially under ty uh, tyrannical regimes, it may mean incarceration torture or death. The expression of the public conscience can be life-threatening or liberty-threatening. And I think it was in his memoir, You Must Set Forth at Dawn, that Shoinka himself describes the pathology of the affliction of the public conscience as being, I quote, due to an over-acute remedial sense of right and wrong, end of quote. It is because this affliction, called a public conscience, can invite life or liberty-threatening situations that it is often not considered a wise thing to have a public conscience. The universe capture the alleged folly or futility of a public conscience in the proverb, 
eni ba fori e fa gbo ni je nbe meaning that the man whose head is used to crack the coconut will not be able to participate in the drinking of the coconut water or the eating of the coconut so why break your head but it appears that men struck by the disease of a public conscience prefer another yoruba proverb which shoinka by the way quoted again in the wraith lectures in the bbc's wraith lectures which translated means sooner death than indignity sooner death than indignity translated to yoruba ikusonju ai bikitalo so for him there's only one answer it is that deprived of dignity the head itself is worth nothing and he makes the point even more poignantly when he said for me justice is the first condition of humanity end of quote so wale shoinka has lived his 90 years on earth with a severe form of this affliction which has often led to his breaking the coconut with his head especially in the many cases where in apparent acceptance of the impotence of the pen or the theatrical stage he abandoned them and headed for the barricades himself sometimes carrying on as though a skull broken against the coconut of injustice was was worth it if the blood from it made the juice and the coconut undrinkable for the oppressor so wale shoinka has interfered with everything he escaped a jail term when he held up a radio station at gun point because the radio station was announcing the fake results of a rigged election but he ran out of luck when he interfered in the civil war he had said at the start of the conflict that biafra could never be defeated and that the so called police action the then federal government was no more than an inglorious war he then followed up with a visit to the rebel enclave in 1966 his words and actions were considered supportive of secession and thus treasonable by the then federal government consequently he was locked up and in solitary confinement for over 2 years wolisho inkas public for which his conscience burns is borderless in the farcical play opera wonyosi shoinka creates a brutally ludicrous caricature of jean bedel bokassa the one time maximum ruler of the central african republic who amongst other crimes killed several school children most people would be wary of saying anything or would have been wary of saying anything against idi amin especially if you were a frequent visitor to uganda at that time but not showing up long before the official inquiry confirmed that confirmed the blood lost of idi amin showing that had concluded that he was and i quote a practicing cannibal who actually kept the heads of his perceived enemies in his freezer for periodic contemplation end of quote as long ago as 1959 he had taken a stand on the infamous hola camp massacre in british colonized kenya where 11 members of the mau mau movement held in detention were beaten to death while 77 were injured under the direction of british officers showing car raised the issue of this travesty again much to the embarrassment of some in the british establishment at his noble lecture before the royal court theatre in london in 1986 all notions of dignity all observances of dignity flow from a public conscience a feeling that humans deserve to be treated as such that their living conditions and circumstances of their death must reflect their humanness that how they are treated even when captured in war 
or convicted of the most heinous offenses must acknowledge this basic fact. Justice itself is a product of the public conscience. That evil must not go unpunished. That some accounting for the wrong done to others is important. And that there is perhaps no greater demeaning of a human person than his being wronged without recourse. The state and seekers after justice are the public conscience that ensure that the aggrieved are given an opportunity for redress. I think we may all agree that this disease called a public conscience is one for which an epidemic is desperately desirable among the Nigerian elite. Because it is this affliction that might force introspection on the elite such that we realize the responsibility that privilege places upon us. The realization that the privileged or the elite, both individually and collectively, have a responsibility, an obligation to society, to plan it, to organize it, to order it, and above all, to make sacrifices for it, for the maximum benefit of all. This is the burden of privilege. It is the expected rule of the elite to find common cause across professions, vocations, ethnicities and faiths, defining the minimum terms and conditions for the safety, security, growth and prosperity of the communities. They define what is lofty, what is noble, what is deserving of honor, and how these values can be sustained, preserved and enforced. This is the burden of privilege. So it is a living public conscience that enables the governing elite to fully appreciate the responsibility of planning an educational system and a relevant curriculum for a country growing at six million persons a year. So the public conscience forces you to the conclusion that grand corruption in a country with so many poor is a crime against humanity and that it must be fought with the vehemence that such a travesty deserves. It is a public conscience that spurs the implementation of universal health care in a nation where over 70% pay for health care out of pocket because we recognize that we owe the people we govern the environment for decent lives and livelihoods. The individual and collective sacrifices required for nation building are impossible without a public conscience. This is what enables us to discount tribe and religion and focus on the good of all. But there's a strange pall over the land, over the public conscience. There seems to be no voice anymore. Perhaps it's the overload of information, the anonymity of social media, a man or woman can hide to fight. In the good old days, you spoke your truth with your chest. And when the authorities came for you, that was that. Today, you can hire a crowd to support any cause, any size of crowd, if you can afford it, complete with well-printed placards and t-shirts with whatever slogan you prefer. Someone on the run from the law has a crowd. Those after him have their own crowd. You can hire a public affairs analyst or an expert, complete with a bow tie. The government can have their own. You can have your own too. The public affairs analyst says that he has never seen such a travesty of the rule of law. His opponent's public affairs analyst praises the judiciary for their sagacity and declares a victory for the rule of law. The press, the press offers no opinion and no analysis. Theirs is just to say who did what and who did not do what. Is there a retreat of the public conscience? Perhaps this is why there is still a place for a 90 year old veteran of many battles to don his battle fatigues and arm up for a fight, even today. 
at mighty showing is entitled to take a back seat and watch others take on the issues watch others join or lead the marches rain abuses on errant political officials and generally be obnoxious to oppression but it appears that this severe affliction of the public conscience has become chronic through the years and now only seems to have metastasized he's not letting up and he cannot till he dies because life is worth nothing if it is lived without challenging indignity and injustice and because when he quoted those now immortal words and i quote the man dies in him who lives in the face of tyranny end of quote as with everything else he stubbornly meant it and he still means it before i take my seat i will pray for professor walesho in that whether he says amen or not <laughs> that the coming years will be years of excellent health and joy for him and that in god's good time the nigeria and africa of your dreams will come to pass in jesus name Happy birthday, Prof. Thank you.